Scotless. Scotless were gangs of youths that terrorised the two cities of Salford and Manchester. There were a series of organised gangland fights that took battle on the very streets that we walk upon today. Britain's first ever youth cult that spawned from the most deprived slum areas and afterbirth of the hardship and unforgiving times of the Industrial Revolution. <coughs> they were born into mass poverty and they were up against it from the second they were born, fighting to survive during one of the hardest eras known to man. The lucky ones managed to get jobs in the local spinning mills and factories, whilst the rest roamed the streets, pickpocketing, thieving, artful dodgers, in order to survive the desperation of hunger. It wasn't necessarily Manchester versus Salford, this was street to street combat, one street versus another. And due to the overpopulation of places like Angel Meadow and Deansgate, gangs formed on literally every street corner. And to make it from one side of the city to the other, without getting into any sort of altercation, was an achievement in itself. The age of these youths varied, anything from 13 years old and it usually ended by the time they were in their early 20s as the gangs were always on the lookout for new recruits and the top boy of a gang was replaced by the next batch of new blood that was wanting to make a name for himself and with each shift in head boy we see the next one to the throne trying to outdo his predecessor becoming more violent and daring in order to make a name for himself. Scuttlers all dressed the same, and they were very noticeable in crowds. Each part of the so-called uniform was carefully selected to inflict as much pain as possible on the rival opponent. Come on, let's get him! Let's get him! Armed with the infamous belt and the buckle that they wield in the air to whip lash and disfigure. The wool brass tip clogs to give someone a good kick in as they lay face down in the cold dirt. They took great pride in their appearance. A silk scarf or a neckerchief pickpocketed from the upper classes and the wealthier parts of the cities. I'll have that, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Nimble fingered. And not forgetting the old flat cap that even the Peaky Blinders drew inspiration from. By order of the Peaky Blinders. So when you're going into town to get your little coffee or go for a nice meal, gawping at the high rise apartments and the glass buildings, spare a thought for what really went on in the city and thank your lucky stars that it wasn't you born in that era at Manchester and Salford was built upon. This is the story of the Scuttlers. <laughs> so without further ado, let me bring to you some of Salford and Manchester's finest young lads and the gangs that they represented. So first up, we have Bill Brooks, the head boy of the Greengate Scuttlers. Bill was a ferocious street fighter, and he wouldn't back down from anyone. He, along with his gang, firmly established the Greengate Scuttlers as a formidable force on the streets of Salford. He gained the respect from the bigger and more well-established gangs in Manchester. He was a wrecking ball of violence and a force to be reckoned with. Next up, we have Henry Burgess of the Meadow Lads, a wild-eyed, steely character with no fear. 
They had convictions ranging from manslaughter, burglaries, and violent assaults on the police. He was feral, crazy, and out of control. He was the epitome of everything that you would despise in a person, all rolled into one. Nobody was safe in his presence. Even his own girlfriend felt the wicked wrath of purges. So much so, that she even lost an eye as a result of crossing his path. Standing to attention, we have Joe Brady, the head boy of the exotic Bengal Tigers. Joe was a handful to put it politely, a masterful fighter, and had a right hand that sent many of his enemies straight to sleep. He fought the old school way, bare knuckle and for a few quid, and like the rest, he had no fear. But sadly his fighting past would one day catch up with him, and a tragic story would unravel in the cold streets of Manchester. Next up, we have the notorious Walter Doll Armstrong of the Adelphi Lads. <laughs> he went by the street name of Doll on the account of his taste for fashionable clothing. And given the poverty of the era, Doll dressed on point and extremely well considering his poor upbringing. The majority of his fine clothing was probably stolen from the upper class areas of Salford. The Adelphi lads were an up and coming band of scuttlers, and they were usually outnumbered by the bigger gangs. But Doll's reputation spread far and wide, and he was always ready for the challenge, even if the odds were stacked against him. But knowing that this was the case, he always carried a blade on the inside of his pocket. So I'm back out and apologies for not making a video for so long it's not for the want of not doing it it's just that this video has taken so much time to just put together the research the, the finding everything out and, and building the stories it's took me so so long just like the first video did the scuttlers but before I go any further I just want to thank each and every person that went out and watched the last video never in my wildest dreams did I think that it reached the views that it did um, and for me and my little channel, it's just hit over 50,000. And for me and my little channel, that is an absolute massive achievement. And I don't go chasing the subscribers and I don't go chasing the views, but it was just so nice to see people taking an interest and they genuinely, you know, enjoyed it. Um, the majority of people enjoyed it. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. So the Scuttlers. Now, they were fir Britain's first ever youth cult. And um, these guys were on a completely different level. And you can already see the influence that they had on the crime world from such, you know, from going back 150 odd years, how it influenced the crime going forward. Um, even the Peaky Blinders, like, taking inspiration of the way that they looked and they dressed. Um, but like I say, these lads were on another level. And uh, what I want to do in this video is I want to not just tell you the story of the Scuttlers, um, I want to basically tell you about the origins of how it started and where it came from then i want to go into the gangs and the gang members because all you ever see is articles and write-ups in the papers and then it, that sort of it, it ends there so what i want to do is revive their stories revive the characters of, the, of these gangs and then end it off ultimately where they ended up which will be a very difficult task because they all ended up in the cemetery um, and don't forget some of these graves are well over 100 and odd year old so the dead they'll be buried and they'll be covered in moss and people wouldn't have gone to them for ages so it is a bit of a needle in an haystack kind of job but this is what i want to do i want to revive it and it's never been done before so sit back get your popcorn out and enjoy because this is a scuttlers part two Right, so here I am, and I'm on the infamous Bengal Street. Now, if you remember rightly, in the last video that I did on the Scuttlers, I documented the rise of uh, the Bengal Tigers 
and an epic battle that took place just off Jersey Street between the Prussia Street lads and the Bengal Tigers where there was over 150 people involved in a mass mass I won't even say it was a fight, it was more of a war um, but where I am today on this street now this has got to be one of the best streets in town this just purely for its historical sort of significance the mills have been converted into apartments and office blocks but its identity is still very much intact um, but there's one man well one lad that I, I want to uh, sort of bring to the attention now he was a formidable ferocious fighter um, and he lived on Blossom Street but the Bengal Tigers recruited him as one of their sort of soldiers and he, he later became the head boy of the Bengal Tigers and he went by the name of John Joe Brader. John Brader was born in 1868 known by his friends and family as Joe the family lived on Blossom Street in Ancoats, with his mum and dad and his two older brothers. Each one of them had jobs, including Joe, who worked as a dyer. With all the family bringing in wages, they lived quite well compared to the rest of the families of the area. Sadly, Joe's father suddenly passed away and his mum became heavily dependent on the wages of her three sons. Oh, I know it's sad. We've all got a pull together. In the absence of Joe's father, Come with us, Joe. Joe began to be led astray. Yeah, mate, do you want a cig? And he ended up being recruited by the local scuttling gang, the Bengal Tigers. By the age of 19, Joe was well known throughout the slums of Manchester. And he became a ferocious street fighter, knocking out many of the rival gang's head boys. The Tigers were a force to be reckoned with, and with Joe steering the ship, it seemed untouchable. By the mid-1880s, the Bengal Tigers' his most feared rival was the Meadow Lads, and their top boy was Owen Wanney Callahan. He was a product of his tough Irish upbringing whose family came over to Manchester in order to live a more prosperous life, working in the eye of the storm of the Industrial Revolution. The two gangs had many altercations and tit-for-tat street fights, but there was only one way it would be resolved and find out once and for all who was the number one scuttling gang in Manchester. So a fair fight was arranged between both head boys. Right lads, you know the rules. Joe Brady. There are no rules. Versus Owen Callahan. Let's go. And a purse bid of 20 shillings was put up for grabs. In a winner takes all bout. Owen was described as being bigger and taller of the two. But this counted for nothing in the eyes of Joe. And after a long hard fist fight. Go on Joe, you've got it. You've got it. You've got it. It's believed that Joe came out on top taking the winnings, along with the title, of Manchester's number one scuttling gang. As the weeks rolled on, Owen's pride was badly dented, along with his ego. He'd been beaten fair and square in front of both gangs, but bubbling away inside of Owen, with bitter rage and he wanted revenge. He wanted to lay hands on Joe. Payback. And on Saturday the 5th of February, the two would clash for the very last time. Joe had been drinking in the local pubs with a few of the Tigers, when suddenly, they were spotted by the Meadow lads, and a fist fight broke out. A quick scuttle took place, but the fighting wasn't over. Owen was sent for, and he was joined by more of the Meadow lads. By this time, Joe and his mates decided to retreat, and out of panic, they found themselves down a flight of stairs and bolted themselves away behind a steel door on 23 Back Holgate Street. By this time, the Meadow lads were sniffing around, and they were out for Brader, banging door to door, smoking him out. 
It could smell blood, like a pack of wild hyenas. Banging on the metal door, Joe was found, who at this point had barricaded himself in, and they were paying for blood. Stood on the other side of the door was Owen Callahan, along with now 20 members of his gang, who were shouting and screaming for him to get outside and face him. A few minutes had passed, and Joe made the conscious decision to go out and face the wild mob alone. Look, this is my fight, lads. Let me handle it. As the door unlocked, Joe was met immediately with a slice of the blade. <laughs> As the blood pulsated out of his body, Joe cried, I'm stabbed. He stood in the face of the Angel Meadow lads as they all drew the weapons and laid it on thick. Joe was hit from every single angle possible. Kicked, punched, even hit with pokers. The wounded Brader had been badly attacked as Callahan stood over his beaten body and without hesitation he pulled out his knife and plunged it straight into the heart of Joe Brader. To the gasp of the crowd. And the once so animated crowd of scuttlers, but only moments before were screaming and shouting, suddenly silenced. Nothing but the ambient sound of Manchester could be heard. They couldn't believe what they'd just witnessed. John Joe Brader died almost immediately on the very pavement he was lay. As the meadow lads dispersed Come on, lads, let's go. Go, 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 go. on the dark, cobbled back streets of Victoria, Manchester. After going on the run and fleeing the city of Manchester, Owen Callahan and four other members of the gang were arrested. Owen was found guilty of manslaughter and was sentenced to 20 years of penal servitude. Right, so here I am. Now somewhere around here used to be back Holgate Street. But sadly for Holgate Street, its original location has been lost in the chapters of Manchester's history really um, but all I know for sure and one thing is for definite is that it happened around here on these very streets this is where Joe sadly took his very last breath um, all over a simple fight you know it was a simple fight that happened and it didn't sit well with Owen Owen had this bit of grudge you know he'd been beat up basically in front of his own um, in a fair fight it was a fair fight now I don't think for one minute that if Owen knew where Joe were at that moment in time, I, I, if, if Owen was on his own, I don't think for one minute he would have done anything. But because he knew he was with his friends, he was with his gang, he knew that now was the time to get him when he was at his most vulnerable, really. Um, but he knew he couldn't beat Joe. Deep down, he knew he couldn't beat him on his own and he needed his backup, basically. And it's, it's mad to think that these very walls that you see, these factory buildings that are still up, you know, they hold the key, they, they witness what went on that night. Um, but just put yourself in Joel's position for a few minutes, you know, you're getting chased by a load of lads, you're outnumbered, you've bolted yourself away. And the poor lad must have been absolutely petrified, but somewhere deep within him, he found the courage to go outside and confront these, these lads on his own. Um, and it was like basically, you know, he, he was been thrown to the wolves, hadn't he? And they attacked him, they, they beat him up, they kicked him, they stabbed him, and then eventually Owen did the final fatal blow, which which killed poor Joe. 
and all that happened on these very streets where I'm walking now it blows my mind So basically, I've come to Phillips Park Cemetery to try and find John Joe Brader. Now, as of, as of yet, I can't locate the grave. Um, but what I do know is that I'm in the approximate location of where he would have been buried. Um, it is so random, the cemetery, because we've gone to the exact location. And I think because the graves are so old, some of them have, have look at my hands, trying to look for him. Some of the um, graves have, uh, have been uh, put flat. Um, after a while, they do that, I think. I think they lay them flat and there's multiple people in each grave and they're all random. Um, but I've got an actual grave. He's, at, he's in number, I think it's nine, 938 or 936. But it'll jump from one, like, 202 to, like, the next grave's 1001. And you think, it's, there's no rhyme or reason to it. But I'm absolutely gutted because I know I'm right near him and I can't see him. I just can't see him. And I've just basically moved the leaves of all these graves that you can see. I've literally moved the graves, uh, moved the leaves, sorry, off the graves to try and make out where he is. And my suspicion is he's, he is approximately here. Now, they could have moved the graves because of that old and, and, you know, it wouldn't surprise me. I don't think they can just get rid of graves, but um, it seems like they've cleared some here in this section. And this could possibly be the old G section that I'm after. But I'm absolutely... It's like bittersweet because one, I know he's here and I know I'm right near him right now, but I can't see him. But it's nice to know that the story's come full circle and we've... We've been and we've documented where he grew up. We've been and documented where he actually took his last breath. And where I am today, right here within this vicinity, is where John Joel Brader is actually buried. The possibility of death always be lingering in the back of the mind of a scholar. It came with the territory. You live by the sword. You die by the sword. And it could happen at any given time. Manchester was a hive of activity, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, and there was no middle ground, no middle class. It was either very wealthy or extremely poor, and at the top of the tree were the fat cats, the mill owners, scooping the cream from the top, an absurd amount of wealth Having never lifted a finger, I walked a day in the life of the poor employee. And the divide wasn't a small step between the two. It was a free fall. And the worker at the bottom was living hand to mouth in order to survive. Families destitute. 
street corners filled with pickpocketers and thieves. I'll have that, thanks very much. As they congregated down the dark ginnels in the dead of night, exchanging the dodgy items. But the soul carefully relieved from the upper class folk of Victoria, Manchester. And not forgetting the chaotic drone of the arguments that was caused by the drunkards having been kicked out of the pubs and drinking dance. Settling the differences in a good old punch up on the cobbles. As the kids would watch on, chanting and cheering, staring straight down the barrel of raw, savage violence. They had no heroes, no one to look up to, other than the Fagan type criminals that take care of them in exchange for supplying their needs in the criminal underworld. And in these mills and factories were scuttlers working in the day and fighting at the night. Gangs would arrange fights by writing in chalk on the brickwork of the factories and down the alleyways and ginnels. A time, a meeting place, and one gang versus another. The word would get about. Are you coming tonight? And the buzz in the mills was talked about. There's over 100 turning up. They couldn't wait to take part in the gang fight, and soon as the klaxon of the mill would sell for the end of the working day. It was a rush to the door and straight to the arranged battleground as the gangs would unite, come together and wage war on each other until one gang could take no more. The next day, word had spread far and wide about the two scuttling gangs having a tear up and the victorious gang had be spoken about in the streets of Manchester and the buzz around the mills would leave other gangs wanting a piece of the action and this cycle continued for generations and one lad thrived off the buzz he was Salford's most notorious scholar and he went by the name of Bill, Bill. Brooks Right, so here I am, and this is the stomping ground of the formidable street fighter Bill Brooks. This is his actual turf, and where I'm stood today is a total contrast into what it actually did look like um, when Bill Brooks was here now. When Bill Brooks and his gang were around here, they basically dominated this landscape. This area was filled with factories, it was filled with rubber works, um, and it was back-to-back -back terraced housing, so congested and so tight. And like I say, it's a different contrast today. Now, other gangs would have came into this area to challenge Bill to see if it was about, you know, did he do what he said on the tin? And many of these um, Scotland gangs that came to challenge him, they basically got their asses kicked. Um, Bill was just unstoppable. He was uh, formidable in a street fight. He was the head boy of his gang and he basically took the Scotland gangs, you know, Salford Scotland gangs were quite, um, not as well known as the ones in Manchester and they weren't as ferocious. But Bill, gradually over time, got hold of his gang and he basically, it was an uprise with them and he challenged the other gangs in Manchester and held his own and the Scuttlers, uh, the Greengate Scuttlers got a reputation for being this absolutely just a destructive group of lads that would back down from nobody and the head boy being Bill Brooks, the face of the Scuttlers. And I think that's why when doing research into Bill, he's the one that I sort of drawn to the most because he was, um, like I say, he's the face of the Scuttlers. If you put anything in online, you research anything, his face pops up with his like squashed nose from all the fighting that he's had. Um, and he was only short and little, and back then there were 
um, they were much shorter, they were much uh, smaller in stature because they were malnourished. The ages of where they should have been growing, they had no, the diets weren't great. They were eating uh, basically rotten food and stuff like that and they were getting no nourishment. And it stunted a lot of the growth of the, uh, the young lads that were growing up and the, the young kids that were growing up. That's not a gunshot by the way. Um, so, so with Bill, basically he was only so short, but he could hold his own, no questions asked. And he made the Greengate scuttle as what they were. And the, the lads in Manchester, the Meadow lads, the Bengal Tigers, they basically stood up, stood back from him because him and his gang were like, they were pretty much like outlaws in a way. And they reigned terror on these streets like you wouldn't believe. Right, so as you can see, we've got the uh, high rise block of flats and all around here is totally changed. But like I say, just over 150 years ago, this place had a different vibe, a different energy and it was home to Bill Brooks and his formidable, ferocious gang. Now, if I just sort of take you here and pan you where this, this car is here. Now, just where this garden fence is, this was Durham Street and the layout today is sort of like this, but the streets went in a diagonal line, back to back, back to back, terraced houses, factories everywhere. And Bill Brooks' house was just here and to think of the stories and the fights and you know the conversations that went on on this little street here is absolutely fascinating and this is where where bill would have spent a lot of his time just basically doing what he did best fighting <laughs> um but like i say sometimes the past is very much in the present and even though all of the all the state has changed and it's gone. The remnants of the past have gone. The echoes, the echoes are, still, are here still here because these are the very cobbles that would have saw battle back in the day when Bill Brooks and his gang reigned terror on the streets of Greengate. A few years after Bill's notorious reign in Greengate, the history books seem to close on him. Many articles of his violent days can be found in the archives of Salford's past. And then just like that, Bill's life seems to have vanished. Did he move away from the life of crime? And start out somewhere else? Or did something happen to him? Who knows? Some records suggest that he worked as a labourer and bounced from job to job, lodging house to lodging house, but ultimately we can't be sure of his whereabouts or resting place. I'm sure whatever he did with his life cloud of chaos most likely followed him, but one thing is for sure, his legacy lives on and his past is scarred into the very cobbles on Green Gate. Because these are the very cobbles, Bill Brooks and his gang reigned terror on the streets of Green Gate. Bill Brooks, a Salford art lad the most feared scuttler to ever have come out of the city. So I just want to say a massive thank you to a woman that's been instrumental in making this video possible. Now, she's called Carol and she's a genealogist. And Carol has literally delved into the archives. I mean, some of these articles that she sent me and pictures, they haven't seen the light of day for absolute decades. And she has basically pinpointed, not just the stories, but pinpointed the graves to these scuttlers. Now, without her help, I couldn't have gone into as much detail as I have in this video. And if you need anything reviving on your past, whether it's your family tree, whether it's you've got a project and you need research doing, I cannot advise you 
to get in contact with Carol. Now, her site is Dig Up My Roots, and I'll leave a link down below to all of her socials. And like I say, she is an absolute star. She's been instrumental in making this video happen. So from the bottom of my heart, Carol, thank you so much for just approaching me and getting involved. And thanks for all your time and effort that you dedicated into helping me and getting this video off the ground. Right, so there it is. Now, this is a very special video because it's filmed over two parts. Part one being what you've just seen today. And part two will be released next weekend. Now, I could have combined the two together, but it had been longer than Avatar. So I thought I'd break it up a bit and you do not want to miss part two. Now it's got more of a slightly edgier vibe to it. It's a bit more wicked because the characters that are involved were a bit more wicked and sinister. So uh, part two, we're going to uncover the story of the wild man from Angel Meadow, Henry Burgess, who basically, he struck the fear of God into everyone that he came into contact with. Now, miraculously enough, we actually found his grave and where he's buried and I cannot wait to show you that next week and this is the grave of Henry Burgess so how uncanny is that and on top of that we have the story of Walter Doll Armstrong who was this sort of charismatic flamboyant character that had a very very sad demise and ending and it all took place in Bexley Square in Salford at the old town hall I'm in the beautiful Bexley Square in Salford and I've always loved this little bit because of that pub there the new Oxford. It's a brilliant pub, but I'm not here for that today. Now, like I say, you don't want to miss out on this. And um, I just want to say thank you to everyone that's tuned in to watch this video and just took an interest in it. Ultimately, I think reviving stories like this, not necessarily the Scuttlers, but reviving the history, it keeps keeps the, um, the memory alive. It gives us a bit of a sense of who we are as people because our families, our grandparents and our great grandparents, they grew up in eras like this and they basically you know it gives us a sense of identity as to who we are so like i say if you like the video i'd much appreciate the sub and um, make sure you tune in for next week because it's going to be a belter so thanks from the bottom of my heart for watching it and i'll see you next time cheers next week on the scuttlers you see in this world there's two kinds of people my friend those with loaded guns And this is the grave of Henry Burgess. So, how uncanny is that? <laughs> I'm in the beautiful Bexley Square in Salford. And I've always loved this little bit because of that pub there, the new Oxford. It's a brilliant pub, but I'm not here for that today.